On this month's episode of Black Girl Talks Pop, no one's dating pool should include people that they've watched grow up. Just because something has been normalized doesn't make it right. If you're going to be problematic, at least make the song a hit, and Megan does that very well. There's a certain kind of healing that happens when someone that looks like you talks about your shared experiences. So I'm sure that the song has given so many people hope. Hey y'all, my name is Ada Grace, and you're listening to my podcast, Black Girl Talks Pop, where I talk about pop culture and all the hits and misses in between. This month will be another music haul. But first, I'll bring back the segment, Hear Me, Hear Me, and introduce a new segment called, Where Did the Black TV Shows Go? Then, on my Patreon, I'll dive into my problems with One Tree Hill's Drama Queens podcast. Then we'll talk music. I'll be reviewing the first albums from the Black pop artist Lou Calla and the jazz artist Christina Shiel, a former member of the acapella group Afro Blue. On my Patreon, I'll discuss Megan Trainor's second album, Thank You, and Go On Sonia's or Girls in the Park's mini album, The Other Side of the Moon. Let's talk about it. Hear me, hear me. comfort food, so I decided to watch a mini One Tree Hill reunion, otherwise known as Lifetime's Christmas Contract. It stars Hilary Burton Morgan, who portrayed Peyton on OTH, Robert Buckley, who portrayed Clay, Antoine Tanner, who portrayed Skills, Danielle Ackles, who portrayed Rachel, and Tyler Hilton, who portrayed Chris Keller. I loved seeing actors from a show I enjoy interact in a new environment. In this movie, Jolie and Jack, played by Hillary and Robert respectively, sign a contract to help the other out during the holidays. Jolie is a website designer who needs a fake boyfriend slash buffer, so she's not embarrassed in front of her ex Foster, who's been flaunting his new girlfriend on social media like a weirdo. Jack, a ghostwriter who wants to write books that have his face on the back cover, needs someone to design his website. Unbeknownst to Jolie, he also wants to go with her to visit her family in Louisiana, because he needs inspiration for the romance novel he's been asked to ghostwrite. In this review, I'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with what I enjoyed about the film. I really appreciated Hillary's acting as well as the writing of her character. This is one of the few TV rom-coms that has a female lead seem like a multi-dimensional person that you know and you relate to. I love that she's a successful woman in STEM that knows how to play the fiddle, cares about the environment, has a loving family, and wants to use her talents to be good to the people around her. I love the sarcasm, warmth, and emotion that Hillary brings to the role. She really gives it life and betrays a southern adjacent, the DMV is not the South, woman in a way that isn't a caricature. It's also nice to see a professional woman with a personality and a heart in a way that's obvious to us, even if Jack misunderstands her at first. I also like seeing a mature love story on TV. I don't think a story has to have sexual elements in it for it to be grown, and this movie was a great example of that. It's clear that both Jolie and Jack have had lives before the situation, and there's assumptions that both of them have about the other that prevent them from understanding each other. I would have loved to learn more about Jack, but the movie chooses to focus on Jolie, and it's nice to watch as Jack learns more about her and sees the person that the mostly female audience will relate to and root for. I like that the romantic element is a slow burn, and through Hillary's acting, we get to see Jolie open up as she sees Jack accepting her and her world. Now it's time to talk about the bad. The movie wants us to see Foster and Amanda as the villains of the movie, but I think that Foster and Jack belong in the bin. Foster believes that Jolie's place is on his romantic Kmart layaway plan. She says that he dumped her because they wanted different things, and that's true. Jolie wanted to settle down with Foster, and Foster seems to have wanted to taste the rainbow before settling for her. On the other hand, Amanda believes that she's superior to Jolie, her family, and even Foster because she has a sophisticated taste in Christmas decorations, and she's vegan. But I don't hate her. Sure, she's rude, but if Foster actually cared about her, he would have set her up for success. 
he doesn't make an effort to introduce her to Jolie or Jolie's family. Instead, she has to introduce herself while Foster looks shocked to see Jolie in her own parents' home. Secondly, Foster doesn't try to find any vegan options for Amanda, so she's hungry. Worst of all, she has to watch Foster put on a show for his ex. Amanda's alone, hungry, and insecure, so of course she gives a bad impression. Foster tries to convince Jolie to get back with him while he's still dating Amanda, and then when Amanda dumps him, he says they just broke up and he only used Amanda to make Jolie jealous, and then he tries to get Jolie to take him back when she clearly saw what actually happened. He doesn't seem to respect anyone that he's in a relationship with, and that's the actual problem. Lifetime's Christmas contract, not about him not knowing what kind of tea she likes. At least he knows that he likes peppermint lattes. Jack is just entitled. He does nothing that he's not contractually obligated to do, but thinks that he deserves the world because of his mere existence. When he messes up, he lies and hopes that the fact that he looks like a low-budget Clark Kent will solve everything. When the movie begins, his sister Naomi and her husband Martin are setting up for a Christmas party. Jolie, who is Naomi's best friend and is not related to her at all, shows up early to help. Jack walks in right before the party begins and sits down with a book while everyone else is plating food. When Jolie points this out, Jack says that Naomi told him that all he had to do was show up. And Naomi confirms this. If I lived close to my family members and they needed my help, they wouldn't have to cut a deal with me like we're children. They wouldn't have to ask. When Jolie protests his ridiculous behavior, Naomi shuts it down by reminding both parties of when they argued about who would give the final toast at her wedding. Jack said that he should have because he's a writer and her brother. Jolie is consistently selfless throughout the entire film, and Jack constantly acts in his own self-interest. While the characters stop hating each other, Jack never really grows up. Last but not least, let's talk about the plain ugly. The ugly truth of oppression is that it never ends with one group of people. White people are oppressing each other. When Jolie realizes that Jack has been wooing her for material for his romance novel, she's understandably devastated, but she acts him to sleep in her sister's house and then take the first flight out. I thought that was an odd request until I remembered my favorite movie, The Parent Trap, when my queen, Elizabeth, tells Meredith to go on the camping trip instead of her, I thought that was an oddly kind thing to ask. Now I'm older and I prefer to observe nature from a distance, I realize that I would ask my worst enemy to go on a camping trip with reptiles, insects, and middle schoolers who hate her. Elizabeth was a genius. Julie expected her sister to greet Jack with the snide, passive-aggressive energy that only a Southern woman can provide because when a woman hates someone, it is expected that the woman in her life also reserve their kindness as well. This is basic girl code. Instead, the sister chooses to believe Jack when he says, I don't know, it's all a coincidence and my acts of kindness are all on a list for my book. The movie shows us that this is false. You are a liar. Earlier in the movie, he's on the phone with his editor saying that he lacks inspiration. She reminds him that he went to Louisiana because that was the setting of the book, and she explicitly tells him to follow the list while he's with Jolie and write from lived experience. To nail this point home, he checks off dancing under the moonlight after they dance at the Christmas market, and then he texts Jolie to give her a flower. Jolie later points out that this act is on the list, and because he couldn't find a flower, he made one. He is lying, and even if he wasn't, we didn't see Bree talk to Jolie about what happened and put her feelings first. Instead, I guess she's so focused on making sure Jolie has a bow for the holidays that she chooses to believe someone she's known for five minutes, who has not only lied to her by pretending to be Jolie's boyfriend slash buffer, but he also lied to Jolie by using her as a test subject for his book. Does Brie, who's Jolie's sister by the way, have so much internalized misogyny that she can't imagine that her sister could be full of holiday cheer and single, or that her sister's being single is better than her falling for a frog? Before Jack has the opportunity to make one last appeal for Jolie's heart, her father tells her, Jojo, you deserve to be happy. You deserve someone who loves you and cherishes you and listens to you. So hear him out. This sounds nice, but it's missing one thing. Jolie deserves someone who asks her things. She deserves someone who will give her agency. 
Jack should have asked what being a fake boyfriend slash buffer would entail and how physical they would be instead of trying to kiss her to quote unquote improvise. He should have told her about the list and she would have probably helped him with it. Having the leads fall in love while going through the list would have been a more interesting story and it would have been fun to explore the power of the romance novel and the magic it promises to its readers. It often invites the reader to slow down and see another human being in an environment where they're able to thrive. Earlier in the movie, Jolie's dad tells Jack, she's special. I have a feeling that you'll let her shine. This kind of reminded me of the Obama's last interview with People magazine in which the president said about Michelle, it's fun when you see your spouse shine and she's shown. When you put someone in a safe space where they're not only centered and included, but also uplifted, they'll light up and you'll be pleasantly surprised to see what people bring to the table when they're able to shine. Jolie lit up around her family and friends. Jack had projected his financial and professional insecurities onto Jolie, but when he got to see her in her element, he saw her creativity, warmth, and thoughtfulness, and he realized that the person he imagined her to be was far from the truth. Jack's feelings towards Jolie changed, even though he was manufacturing romance. And I wish that Jolie had been able to get to know Jack in a genuine way as well. She fell for the world that he created in which he's helpful and thoughtful out of the goodness of his heart. And that wasn't the case. This movie shows us that women aren't dumb or silly for enjoying or even subscribing to the promise of being fully and completely seen and receiving love for who they are. And men aren't above that message either. That's what Jolie deserves, but it's too bad her own family doesn't think so. With all that said, I feel comfortable giving this movie 6 out of 10 alligator ornaments. I could watch it again, even though I'm not rooting for the couple. It's definitely a step forward in writing a female lead of a rom-com, or maybe that's all Hillary's acting. But I feel that writers of rom-coms, as well as the authors of romance novels, need to start imagining a world where men can do better. In my opinion, Jolie settling for a guy who's selfish and dishonest and lives with three roommates is not a happy ending. So, where did the black TV shows go? I'm sure you're asking why did I start this segment? Well, it seems that everyone on Twitter misses the same eight black sitcoms, and when I rewatch many of them, I've realized that I often don't see myself in the leads. On the other hand, if I feel that the lead reflects me as a dark-skinned black woman, I don't like the feedback I'm getting about my reflection. Even in the 90s and the early 2000s, a time that some would consider the golden age of black music and cinema, there was a message that dark-skinned black women between the ages of 9 to 40 don't exist. If they do, they're demeaned, mocked, or meant to serve as a supportive, almost motherly role to their light-skinned or non-black counterparts. Or, they're a sarcastic spinster that can't get a man because of their feisty personality and they need to be softer and gentler like everyone else. The message appeared to be, if dark-skinned black women aren't stepped on out of malice, then they should willingly serve as a rung on the ladder to someone else's path to true love, a dream job, or any other marker of success. If a dark-skinned black woman dared to be beautiful and brilliant in her own right, she was often referred to as ratchet, angry, intense, uppity, or any other word that suggests that she can never demand too much from anyone around her because her very existence is an inconvenience. If she sets high standards, she's uppity. If she sets boundaries, she's angry. I hope to be part of a movement that changes this narrative about us. In this segment, I'll recap shows in which dark-skinned black women and girls usually between the ages of 25 to 40, are the main leads. Also, any show that has a black lead will have a mostly black audience anyway, no matter how much Hollywood tries to whitewash the casting or add in lessons for the non-existent white audience, but I'll talk about that another time. Anyway, I want to support shows in which starts in black women are allowed to be the main characters of their story instead of the butt of someone else's joke. I hope to uplift creatives that will imagine a world in which dark-skinned black women and girls are loved, cared for, and supported as they reach their goals. And I believe that one day, life will imitate art. 
With that, let's talk about Run the World. While this show is supposed to have four leads, the trailer makes you think that the lead character is Whitney, who's portrayed by Amber Stevens West, the black girl from the TV show Greek that was on Freeform when it was ABC Family. Whitney is a high-powered executive that brings major IPOs to the stock market, and she's engaged to a Nigerian doctor, Ola BC, or Ola. From episode one, the colorism on the show is strong, and it was surprising since the show was created by a dark-skinned black woman. We see that the light-skinned biracial woman is in one of the healthiest and most loving relationships in the show, and she proceeds to ruin everything. I don't get it, I don't like her, and that never changes. Let's talk about all the strikes that Whitney has that knock her out of my list of favorite characters pretty early on. The first strike is hypocrisy. Whitney's xenophobia jumps out and takes off when she talks about Ola's Nigerian family as if she and her family are so much classier. However, she and the girls are putting together wedding invitations in a dirty bar instead of Whitney's hopefully clean home. Maybe that's a statement of how little Whitney cares about the wedding, but it's not adding up. The second strike is xenophobia in three ways. First, she continues to mispronounce Ola's name, but I guess he's too color struck to care. Then, the show stereotypes Nigerian families as oversized and obnoxious. The Nigerian aunties are behaving the same way that Whitney's mother is, but they are painted as the problem. The final incident of xenophobia is Whitney's elitism. She disrespects a gaily by referring to it as a do-rag thingy, but she should be more concerned about paying $350 for an updo, and getting expensive fish when it's clear that everybody likes tilapia. The third and final strike is the act that creates a conflict for Whitney's character for the rest of the season. She cheats on her loving fiance with the community pep in your step. Whitney says that she wants to have more dating experiences, but her friends that are dating around are trying to have what she's got, and they tell her this. Also, shouldn't you be dating your partner? She refuses to listen, and I have a theory that she actually doesn't like Ola that much, but would rather be with the doctor than be single. It's sad that she's wasting emotional energy being down about a wedding she doesn't want. And it's worse that she's wasting this man's time, although I have limited empathy for him too. The next girlfriend we'll discuss is Sandy, who's portrayed by Corbin Reed. I love when women have traditionally masculine names. Is it internalized misogyny to think that women with these names are automatically cooler? Probably, so I'll work through that. Sandy, the other type three on the show, is secretly dating Matthew, her professor, and she often spends the night with him and wakes up to play house with his young daughter, Amari. Sandy and Matthew do a terrible job of keeping their relationship a secret. If the university isn't supposed to know, why is Sandy running personal errands on Matthew's behalf, like dropping off the tuition check for his daughter's ballet class? Sandy makes the executive decision to pull Amari from the ballet program after the instructor makes bat phobic comments about Amari's body. And I admit it, the instructor's assumptions about Amari's eating habits are high key racist. Bat phobic comments should not be aimed towards anyone, but there's a special hell for people who body shame children. Although Sonny's reasons were noble, it was not her decision to make. She should have told Matthew what happened and encouraged him to pull Amari from the program, but he obviously didn't see it as a problem. It appears that Amari's dad is not really trying to raise her to have a black consciousness. Did Amari's dad's girlfriend know this before they started living together? Or is she trying to raise someone else's child her way? The kicker is that when Matthew and Sandy fight about her wrongdoing, he accuses her of acting too mature. But that's rich. Matthew, if you were actually looking for an age-appropriate partner, you would have found one instead of preying upon your student. What you actually want is a younger adult to make you feel important, raise your kid, warm your bed, and just be around to look at you with stars in her eyes unless you're ready to engage in a debate. You're not looking for a serious life partner, and dating your student reflects that. Please spare us. Ella is betrayed by the lovely Andrea Bardot. She's an online journalist for a black news site that she thinks she's too good for, and she spends more time complaining about her assignment than actually working on it. 
it seems that she has the classic story of a black artist or creative being disgraced from the mainstream, but still turning her nose at the acts of kindness from the community. I did feel bad for her because she had a pretty bad day. I was infuriated on her behalf when they showed up to Soldier Boy's party, and then she and Renee were denied from the VIP section. Ella is at the party for her job, a black news site that keeps people like Soldier Boy relevant, and she and Renee are actually black. But who are the VIPs at Soldier Boy's party? Black men, the woman with as much distance from blackness as humanly possible, and non-black dudes with a black scent. I'm pretty sure Peter De La Ghetto didn't have trouble getting into the VIP section. This moment just showed how little respect brown and dark skinned black women receive. Most importantly, we are human beings and we are also the people that support black artists before, during, and after they are mainstream. No one else actually cares about Soulja Boy's career or reminding Twitter about his contributions to music and culture besides black women, especially the woman who couldn't sit in his section. Then, Ella is reunited with her ex Anderson, who's played by the black guy in the Christmas Swift universe, and the corniness that might work on Netflix is not doing it on stars. Who dressed this man? Why is he in a sweater at the club? Even though Renee drags him for filth, Ella still kisses him. I guess love is blind and so are soul ties. Ella ends her bad day by having a bad time with Peter De La Ghetto, who can't seem to do what he said he was going to do. While I dislike his character, I do think it's weird to portray the Asian man as sexually incompetent with all the stereotypes. Also, Sonny and Whitney have cute moments with their partners, so it was tough seeing the dark skin woman not catch any breaks or get any love at all. Then, when she goes to Sonny for comfort, which was a very interesting plot point as I love seeing the dynamics within a friend group, Sonny literally makes her hold up her fist and repeat that she's a strong black woman. What is that? No, ma'am. Ladies, if you have any friend who would do that to you, especially at your lowest point, demote them to a close acquaintance or even just a basic acquaintance quickly. Also, we have got to stop telling each other to be strong and allow each other to express, process, and stay in our feelings. We need to give ourselves and each other time to process history so we don't repeat it. And it seems that Ella has been too busy to properly grieve her relationship with Anderson and find a job that reflects her passions. Also, Sonny's response showed the lack of empathy that lighter black women can have towards their darker sisters. You don't want others to dismiss you, so don't do that to us. Our last friend in our head, Renee, is portrayed by the one, the only, the brilliant, and the gorgeous light that is Brescia Webb. Congratulations on your engagement. I would also like to lift up Brescia in prayer after she had to endure the wounds that can only be inflicted by white people who use their black friends as a shield to hide behind their racially insensitive antics. During Breach's interview on the Unzipped podcast, Anna Lynn decided to debut a fresh new black scent and now she's from the South, like that's supposed to convince that she's an ally. That's at least negative five allyship points. Tell Brisha to not let her white skin fool her because she's got soul on the inside and to top it all off, she let all of us know that her best friend is half black and half Japanese. I would also like to lift up this supposed best friend in prayer because if y'all are such great friends, Anna Lynn, you should have known better than to embarrass her like this. I pray for healing for Brisha, myself, and any other black person that has had to endure in Anna Lynn. And I pray that the Lord will surround the half black half Japanese bestie with a community that will understand, support, and exchange those looks with her as needed. It was my understanding that Brisha Webb was supposed to be a lead on the show, but the writer seemed to have forgotten this. Renee's character is just around for shock moments and comic relief, even if they don't make sense for her character. Renee is a black woman in her early to mid thirties that's trying to be a stay at home wife or a wealthy man. Do we think she's on social justice Twitter? Do we think she's even on Twitter? 
the correct answers to both questions would be no. Renee clearly thrives on Instagram. If she's not sharing amazing selfies, she's sharing low resolution quotes about relationships and reposting viral posts from TikTok. Renee refers to this white woman as a colonizer while on the phone with Ella, which seems like a word for social justice Twitter and commentary YouTube only. And then she confronts the woman by quoting Maya Angelou's phenomenal woman. If you're going to assert yourself with someone, shouldn't you use literature that they've already read? Or was that a more confrontational way of saying, add this to your reading list? It seems like something that would happen in Good Trouble, which is a fever dream for progressive zennials and Gen Z. And I thought that this show would be a little more grounded. Then we see Renee wake up Ella for her job and try and fail to protect her from Anderson's potent sexuality, which seems to be so powerful that even his checkered sweater can't seem to hide it. While I appreciate these scenes, because I felt like it provided us the healing from Tony and Maya's bickering on girlfriends, it's nice for a show to show us that dark skin and brown skin women hang out, like we're friends. We're not trying to compete to be the only one in the black friend group, like we might tend to draw closer to each other because we have similar experiences or maybe there's more of us than our lighter sisters like maybe that's a reality that Hollywood just can't accept but we're moving on while I appreciated these scenes I was disappointed that the show didn't give us the conflict with Renee's character until later on in the season Renee has main character energy and she needs to be treated like one she's actually a main character of the show and I'm so tired of writers forgetting about brown and dark skinned women until later episodes are promising that they'll have their moment in season two. Renee should have had her story introduced in the pilot. Anyway, those are my thoughts on this episode. I'll come to you next month with my review on the second one. If it's interesting enough, we'll see. This is my music haul! I can't wait to share the music that's newish to me. The music that I've mentioned and purchased will be available in the Spotify playlist that you can find in my link tree in the description below. Blue Cala's TikTok of her singing Love Shh was shared on Twitter with the tweet, Where are the black pop girls at? I loved the song and I was so excited to see another black girl in pop music. I'll be reviewing her debut album, Worthy. I'm learning that when an artist gives you an album with eight songs, it's usually good. Her tone is a little similar to Elle Golding's, but she's got more grit and emotion in her vocal delivery. I really appreciate Lou's storytelling in her writing and vocal performance. It feels like she's talking to you, but you also feel that you're experiencing these situations along with her. There was no song that I didn't like, but there were certain songs that I decided not to buy out of personal preference. It's heartbreaking that a lot of these songs are discussing her being cheated on or not being claimed by a romantic interest, but I can't tell someone how to share their experience. When Luke Heller performed on Play the Parks, she said that Don't Count Me Out was a response to the professional and personal peers who counted her out due to their fat phobia. It was a catchy song with sad lyrics, and I always pause when a person's breakout single discusses their oppression. All I can do is empathize and work to prevent these challenges for other artists by supporting beautiful, talented artists like Luke Calla and showing the industry that she is marketable and she has a fan base that is looking forward to her work. I also want to revisit my personal reading of Don't Count Me Out and tie it to the professional experiences that may have inspired the song. While Lucala is rejecting the fat bully of the industry, she still wants to be part of the machine. And this is a frustrating side of being a member of several marginalized communities, having to deal with the majority. While we can tell Lucala a curvy and black artist to build her own community, why shouldn't she be able to be part of the mainstream? Why shouldn't she have the opportunity to be on the same places and stages that have been defining moments for other artists? Why shouldn't she be able to have sold out tours and the specials that debut on a streaming service or TV network? Why does she have to talk about and possibly relive the pain that the industry inflicted on her to get there? She should not have been counted out by anyone in the first place. 
While it was a good song, it wasn't for me, but it doesn't need to be. There's a certain kind of healing that happens when someone that looks like you talks about your shared experiences, so I'm sure that the song has given so many people hope. I can understand how it's sentimental for her as it's her debut single, and it's an anthem for women who share her experience as a curvier black woman in a whitewashed, fatphobic industry and world. The second song I didn't buy was Body New, a song that I liked but didn't love. My interpretation was that she wished her body knew that her lover was cheating on her. While I appreciated having a song about woman's intuition, the song didn't stick with me personally. Now I'll discuss what I bought. I've categorized the songs as the following. The first category is experimentation. While these songs had a different sound, they naturally flowed with the rest of the songs. The album has a really strong start with Years for the Night, which I could totally hear on a CW or freeform drama. The tension that was created with the chant in the first verse in the chorus, as well as the haunting ooh, 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 ad-libs, set you up for a moment that I feel would pair well with the teen confession. In the story in my head, I imagine an enemies to lovers scenario that only makes sense in high school. Our leads would finally kiss and get together, but then they have to hide it from their respective friend groups because their friends wouldn't understand their connection initially, but then they end up being the best couple on the show. Anyway, moving on to the actual album. I also like when she does these gritty growling belts near the end of the song. I don't really know the term for it, but I appreciate how she mixes up her vocal performance in what could have just been a standard pop song. Another standout was No Smoke, which gives a pop disco moment that I always love. I want a modern pop artist to do a disco album, but it seems that most of our faves would rather promise a disco album than make one. The next category is Snaps slash Claps which as you may know, are one of my negotiable requirements for a pop hit. They always make me like a song so much more. They set up the song to be a hit and it's nice when the song delivers on the tension that these sounds create with an amazing chorus. Still Mad gave me snaps slash claps along with the guitar moment in the verses, so it met two of my three requirements. I also loved her lower range in the verses. Lush not only literally snapped, but also showed Lou's emotional growth from Don't Count Me Out. This album weaves a heartbreaking and powerful narrative. In this song, it feels like she's looking back at the events in the other songs and saying that she's willing to wait for a loving relationship because she knows that she deserves it. And it was wonderful to hear. Lastly, I have to shout out the lyricism in this album. Lou knows how to write a hook, but I also want to talk about some lyrical moments I loved in the verses. I really enjoyed this lyric in Want, you read my body like a magazine cover, skim through, and toss it away. Absolutely devastating. On the barely brighter side, I also enjoyed the concept of the song Love Like. I think the term Love Like is very cute and creative, even though it's describing a situationship. I also appreciated her acoustic performance of the song as well. It expressed the song in a different way, and I wish the performance was posted on her main channel because it's great. The album feels like it should be on a 2015-2016 teen drama playlist, and I completely love that. It also has the 2016 Island vibe that was popularized with Say Sorry, Work, and other pop hits of that year, but it still sounds fresh because Lou Kala adds her own spin. Worthy takes all the good musical moments from 2015-2016 pop and leaves the unnecessary quirkiness behind. If you enjoyed those two years of American pop music, you'll have a great time with this album. At the end of the day, the album did lose one and a half stars for the songs I didn't buy. One star for Body New and half a star for Don't Count Me Out. Anyway, Worthy is a good breakup album. I personally like to cry to upbeat music, so whenever I'm really down about any disappointment, this album would be perfect. However, the lyrics are catchy and the music is fun, so whenever I want to have a good vibe, this album is also perfect. In general, Worthy is an amazing pop album, capital P-O-P, -P, pop album, so I'm happy to add it to my new Magic and Friendship playlist. It's a hit, 8.5 out of 10 snaps. I wish I found it last year when it came out, but better late than never. Thank you, Black Twitter.
I was first introduced to Christy DeShio when I watched the third season of The Sing-Off in my music theory class. I was drawn to her relaxed stage presence and honeyed vocal tone. She was the lead vocalist of the a cappella group Afro Blue, and when she was at the helm, you knew that their performances would not just be perfect, but effortless. She made jazz-inspired arrangements inviting and comforting to someone like me, who isn't really familiar with that style of music. While she was a standout from the group, I also loved the flirty fun that Daniel Withers, another vocalist from the group, brought to the table as well. I've linked my top three favorite performances from Afro Blue below, and you can find them on my R&B Bass playlist as well. I have to say that I only listen to their version of Put Your Records On because it's just that good. Moving on to Christy, I was so excited when I finally followed her on Instagram and saw that she had released her first album, Time All Mine. I really enjoyed it, so let's jump into the discussion. The first category of songs is obvious, the jazz bar bops. The album starts out strong with Dreamland, which sets up the soft, dreamy atmosphere of the entire album. The instrumental drives the song forward, and her smooth vocal performance grounds the song so it's not too whimsical. It's almost like she's gently guiding you to a different dimension, so you barely notice that you're listening to something new. Her voice gently welcomes you to her world of jazz, while the music pushes you over the edge. It's like she's saying, so, this is jazz. Jazz is accessible and fun. I'm a very talented jazz singer, but I'll only give you a little bit of that for now. Another song that shows off her jazz vocals is the title song, Time All Mine, which is my second favorite track. This is a song I need for this moment in my life. It's a challenge to claim your time and not define it by other people's standards. It's easy to say you will get to where you need to be in your own time, but it's hard to consistently believe that and follow through. I've wasted so much time comparing my life to others that I haven't accomplished all I need to do. To sum up the song, comparison is a thief of time. It's a timeless idea that's presented in a unique and refreshing way. The lyrics are so powerful that I almost didn't notice the key changes. You also notice in the song that she starts to show off just a little more than she does in the earlier songs. Overall, I really appreciate the song arrangement on this album. Time All Mine is the third song, and it's where she and the other musicians begin to take off. We are leaving the world of simple arrangements behind and have truly entered dreamland. The less exciting name for this album is Jazz for the Less Informed, and I appreciate that. The most significant stop in dreamland is Dynasty, where she just casually scats for an entire song. I thought I'd be a hater and be annoyed by it, but I'm just tired of Christie's talent. That's what's so frustrating. Her voice is as much as an instrument as any of the other instruments playing, and I was floored. I mean, I knew this album would be good, but having the honor of hearing her sing on her own is a blessing. Her voice truly is a delight. However, I did feel that Dynasty should have been a surprise for the listener. She's too impressive too soon. It's the sixth song of the album, and I can see why she'd sell it as a peak of the album vocally, musically, and emotionally, but I worry that it's too big of a risk to place a hit or miss song at the climax of the album. If this song isn't a hit, someone could think, we have six songs left, and this is what we're doing. Personally, I would have made it the eighth or ninth song on the album as kind of a fun twist. I have to deduct 0.5 points. Well, I enjoy scatting, not everyone does, and the way this album is constructed suggests that Christy wants to make jazz as universal as possible. While I love discovering the dimensions of Christy's talent, I also appreciate that her songs aren't too highbrow and theme. All of them are very relatable, and the songs that encompass the slice of life theme the most were How to Love and Thinking of You. Thinking of You was an honorable mention that the album could have lived without, so negative 0.25 for that one. However, I really enjoyed How to Love. I'd love this song to be a theme song for a show or in a movie soundtrack. The part of the album that really shocked me was not the scatting because she did that on Afro Blue's cover of Killing Me Softly. I was really moved by what I'll call the DreamWorks movie moments. In these songs, she got to go outside the jazz genre, and that's where she signed vocally for me. My favorite song on the album is his song, which is another track that really blessed my spirit. 
I'm pretty sure that I had the same reaction to Salty's Cast My Cares when I was a kid. You know those songs that seem so simple, but they punch you in the gut emotionally? Well, that's his song for me. It's like Christy is being that friend that's a safe space for a good cry. It felt like I was hearing from an older sister, and I really needed it. Her voice is very healing and soothing, and I was nourished by the message of the song. She's telling us to let go and let God move the mountain. Let go and let God hold the sea. Another song that felt like it could have been used as a turning point in a religious DreamWorks film was sketches of T.A.M. or Time All Mine. I wish there had been more interludes where she could show off her voice without so much instrumentation. The last category of what I enjoy were the Christian bops. I'm still surprised and confused, hence the question mark in my voice. I was pleasantly surprised by his song and I also really liked Save Me. I liked the beginning, so I was worried when the song went into remix mode. It kind of reminded me of the disappointment that some fans may have had when SNSD's TTS subunit's Christmas song, Dear Santa, went from a slow R&B tune to Jingle Bells. I actually like Dear Santa, but I understand others' frustrations. Anyway, I'm glad my worries about Save Me were for naught. I liked how she mixed songs about her faith within the album. It reminded me of early CCM albums in which every song wasn't a worship song or even talked about God directly. It was a nice surprise to think that this really interesting piece of work could be considered a CCM album. Last and unfortunately least, I have to talk about some honorable mentions. Jazz bar music isn't completely for me. Well, I just call to say I love you has a sweet message. It wasn't a strong track for me. However, it's where the scatting starts and I was pleasantly surprised by the interlude. The second song I didn't love as much as her cover of The Way You Look Tonight. I wish she had either stuck to the original song or done something completely different. She ends up doing a little of both and I wasn't pleased. This time she's too low key for her own good. I wanted her to go out of the box a little bit more because by this point the songs weren't as strong as the earlier part of the album. I was ready for another surprise and the cover didn't give me what I needed. Fortunately, it's right before Saved Me, which in my opinion saved the album from being too one note. I could have lived without both of these songs, but they're not bad, so I'll take 0.25 for each one for a deduction of 0.5. I really like this album. I highly recommend it. However, I'm going to have to take an additional 0.25 because there are moments where I wanted her voice to stand out a little bit more. I get that she wants her voice to be another instrument, but when it's your album, you need to be the storyteller in control of the narrative. You need to drive the story along, in my personal opinion, and I felt that her vocal performance was almost too smooth, and sometimes I had to pay extra attention to hear and feel the story. She shined the most when the other musicians actively took a backseat. In spite of my complaints, I give this album a score of 8.75 out of 10 glasses of lemonade on a summer day because this album's sound and message is so refreshing. This is the highest ranked album so far, so you can tell that it's definitely a hit or miss for me. I felt very grown up and sophisticated enjoying a jazz album and I don't know if it was intentional, but Christy confidently leads the listener through the album as if she knows that non-jazz people like me would feel out of their depth at first. I appreciate the consideration, even if it's all in my head. I was so excited to see that she had music out, and I'm glad that she delivered. Her Instagram is so inspirational, she's still singing and doing what she loves, and I'm honored that I get to witness her amazing talent. She's incredible. I want another album. Pronto! Now. I'll close this episode with a prayer. Lord, I thank you for giving me the courage to come back with another episode. I'm so glad that I was able to share the music I've enjoyed with the listeners, and I pray that you will give them the strength to do whatever you've placed on their hearts. As this year comes to a close, and we start to be even more reflective on the past months, help us to lay aside our fears and share our burdens with the people who have shown us that they care. 
help us to be gentle with ourselves and give ourselves room to grow, even as this year comes to a close. There is still time to start following through with the goals we've made for this year. As we continue to look back, help us to not only check and acknowledge our privileges, but do the harder work of intentionally undoing them so that we can acknowledge and uplift the experiences of others. Let every area of our lives reflect the endless diversity of humanity that you created, and let every area of our lives respect the journeys of those whose roads have been made more difficult. Let our reflection give way to the celebration of others' talent and ingenuity and create a new path that will prevent unnecessary struggle and end generational cycles of trauma. I lift these prayers to you today, and I thank you for hearing our request always. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's over? Can this podcast go on forever? At the right price? I'll consider it. Check out previous episodes of the podcast. If you're on YouTube, you'll see some on the screen. And listen to the rest of this episode on Patreon for just $5 a month. I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.